Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to see so much interest in these webinars. Um, and uh, yes, many of you, I think, were here uh, last year when we held our series, which really focused on the on the current planning system. And we spoke a lot about the new national planning framework for. Um, uh, so uh, this was the new planning framework that was brought in uh, in the 2019 legislation that has got more weight than previous ones and therefore will be more impactful on planning decisions. And we were particularly pleased that the climate and nature crises were recognised as joint emergencies and were given significant weight in decision making in that document. Um, and biodiversity policies meant that nature not only has to be protected, but enhanced. Um, so that was in February last year, 2023. So um, policies and plans do take a while to bed in. Um, but there seems to be quite a lot that needs to be done before these progressive policies can really have an impact. Um, and the evidence that we're seeing, we've done a bit of research ourselves, um, that there's fairly much business as usual. We're not seeing huge changes. Um, you know, developers are continuing to sort of try and work the system uh, to put uh, profits before planet. Um, but uh, and and I think I get a sense that the planners are still feeling quite, um, you know, lacking in knowledge and 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 you know not quite sure how to implement um, these policies uh, to to really make sure that we are actually enhancing nature and protecting it. Um, and of course, everybody says that there's a lack of resources, and indeed planners are. It must be said, very hard pushed nowadays. Um, but. My feeling is that these can be overcome when there is a will. Um, and it seems to me um, that overall there's a lack of understanding about nature, its complexity, lack of connection to our natural world and a lack of sense of urgency and commitment to restoring nature. And in many senses, too, that includes us. Um, and, you know, we to have a role to play in, in protecting and enhancing nature. Um, and I think it's crucial um, that we get, you know, get on and learn ourselves. And that's exactly what we're here to do tonight. Um, sadly, we've got very little time to do it in, um, to restore Scotland's highly depleted um, species and habitats, which are showing that, you know, even the, the rare species are becoming rarer, but what's really worrying, I think, is that the most common species are becoming less abundant too. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed how bad the bird population uh, is declining um, in, our, you know, in my own garden. I'm just seeing how ca catastrophic it is. You know, our once busy bird um, feeder uh, that had 20, 30 birds on um, is, is eerily quiet this year. Um, and it's, and, you know, we don't have to refill it as, as nearly as often as we used to. Um, so it's a bit worrying that since MPF4 was adopted, the government do seem to be backtracking on nature commitments and placing less emphasis on biodiversity than they were. Um, maybe it's something to do with coalition breaking up with the Greens. Um, the Scottish government's decision to redirect five million pounds from its na nature restoration fund to settle local government pay disputes shows how things are going backwards. Um, and I think we've got a link to an article by Scottish Environment Link um, that we can put into the uh, chat or, or send you later about that. Um, and also the, the last letter from the minister and the chief planner setting out this year's planning priorities uh, didn't actually mention biodiversity. Um, so this was something I raised with the Minister Ivan McKee, and I would urge anybody to write to him um, via your own um, MSPs to, to keep the pressure on to, to not forget nature um, and to put the resources in it. Um, so I think we, um, I'm hoping somebody's going to be putting something in about how you can find out uh, um, that chief planner's letter, uh, but how you can write to your uh, MSP as well. Um, so, um, yeah, it's not, uh, we're not sure we can rely just on, on government and planners to restore nature and indeed, why should they have to? I think it's important that we all have to, um, take care of nature. Um, so I think, you know, communities are really well placed to respond much as they did during the pandemic. 
So um, our response to that is to try and arm you guys with as much information um, and motivation as you can muster. Think citizen science and community action are the way forward in protecting nature. Um, but what's become clear to Nikki and I as we've been doing things is how important it is to know what is around us already, <clears throat> what's um, what's on a site, uh, what kind of nature is there, and how how we should be monitoring, um, and and who is recording that data, and where is it recorded? Um, so that's why we've uh, organised this first webinar, very much focused on recording um, and biodiversity data, um, and that's why um, we've invited Caroline McParland. Um, for, who's the vice president for the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, or SAIM as they're called, um, which is a professional body for ecologists in the UK and Ireland. Um, and she also works in ecological consultancy. So she's going to be explaining, um, well, we've actually given her quite a large brief, so she's probably not going to manage to speak everything, but um, she'll be giving you some information, um, what she can in her time. And then after the break, we'll be hearing from Christine Tanzi, who is the partnership officer for the Better, Biodiv Better Biodiversity Data Project um, at the National Biodiversity Network or the MBN Trust. And her background is in conservation and research, particularly relating to uh, citizen science, woods and trees. So she'll be going on to explain how we record nature and where it all goes and so on. So um, without further ado, I shall in, um, introduce Caroline. Um, just to say, please do put your questions in the in the. Um, uh, chat we will try and answer them but if we can't um, tonight might not be the right uh, webinar for some of the questions so over the course of the four webinars we will try and answer all your questions if we don't we will try and get stuff into the guidance for you um, and if we're still not managing that you come back to us and just say we still don't understand and we shall try and help as much as we can Right, without further ado, um, Caroline, thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you, uh, Claire, for that uh, welcome. Um, as I say, um, potentially quite a lot to cover, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to cover as much as I can. Um, I just wanted to really give you an overview, um, which may be familiar to some of you. I did see a few familiar uh, names joining the chat there. So um, I think there's one or two people who might know more than I do on this topic, but hopefully um, this will uh, be helpful for as many of you as possible. Um, can I just check that you can see my slides and not my, my notes page? Okay, great. That's fabulous. I'll just pull up my notes page here. So um, as Claire said, I'm uh, the um, Vice President uh, for Scotland of uh, the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. And that's the uh, professional body for ecologists and environmental managers in the UK and Ireland. Um, we, uh, we have about uh, 8,000 members so far, about 10% in Scotland, and we're growing very rapidly. Um, and really, um, our vision is of a healthy natural environment for the uh, benefit of current and future generations. And we try and achieve that through a whole range of ways, through policy engagement, through setting industry standards, promoting sharing of best practice. And that's through training courses, conferences. Some of them we lead ourselves. Sometimes we do it jointly. Other times we'll point our members and others um, to other providers as well, where we see that there's a um, there's a really good training course. Um, so we recognize the, the pressures that uh, nature uh, are under and, uh, and uh, we're you know, working through um, all of our members um, to try and uh, influence that in a positive way. Um, we also um, advocate an integrated approach. We don't work um, in isolation. Um, we work with all sorts of other environmental specialists like hydrologists and acousticians and air quality specialists and with planners and developers as well, as well as um, influencing government directly on policy. So it's, it's really helping us understand the wider environment that we are working within as well. Um, we've got quite a broad membership these days. Um, I'll just pull those up. We've got people in SNC A's here, so Nature Scott SEPA, folk like that, people in consultancy like myself, 
people from environmental NGOs and local authorities, people from industry as well are part of our membership and also people in academia. Um, so, you know, it's a really um, broad base of members these days, which is great because that's that's a huge, um, you know, reach of expertise that we have across the membership. Um, we do quite a lot to represent the views of our members, um, engaging with um, parliaments and devolved governments with civil servants. So, for example, um, I sit on the um, technical advisory group for biodiversity for the Scottish Government's Planning, Architecture and Regeneration Division. Um, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, and lots of our volunteer members um, perform similar roles. We respond to um, consultations. Um, we've got a wide range of different technical committees and working groups. Um, our Scottish Member Network Committee um, does quite a, a range of webinars and site visits and, and talks throughout the year. They're really active. Um, and this is all um, largely done through volunteers as well. I think we have in terms of volunteer hours per year, it's something like over 20 people working full time between all of our hundreds of volunteers. So we're really, really active. Um, we contribute to publications as well. We've got our own in-house magazine. Um, we've got a whole range of special interest groups. So we've got our early careers group. We've got a marine group. We've got uh, an uh, ecological restoration group and, and lots of others. Um, so it's a really, really broad church. Um, you know, one of the, the reasons um, that we're so busy these days and growing is, um, as, as Claire alluded to, there is there is a crisis in the sector. We simply don't have enough trained ecologists. And that is a real risk um, for um, local governments, for planning authorities to actually deliver on things like um, the biodiversity policy in NPF4. Um, at the end of the talk, I can share some um, results from a survey that Syeen carried out a couple of years ago on the stats around that in Scotland. And um, I can share the link. That's something else you might want to share with your MSPs. We certainly shared it with the government, but there are actual numbers on that, on just um, how shorthanded planning authorities are. Um, it's a similar story in England, unfortunately. And there are all sorts of reasons for it. Lack of investment, um, lack of people coming into the sector, and also barriers to people joining as well. It's unfortunately one of the least diverse professions. We're working very, very hard to change that. Um, so we've got an active uh, Green Jobs for Nature site, but also I think engaging communities as well with all of your local knowledge is, is a big part of the answer there, just to try and increase that capacity to help inform good planning decisions. Um, so we've got a couple of um, online uh, platforms on Green Jobs for Nature, just explaining the breadth of uh, different jobs. And we also do quite a bit uh, in terms of we're developing um, some pre-university level apprenticeships now as well, uh, primarily in England, but that's going to hopefully come in Scotland as well, just to try and increase that capacity so that it's not simply limited to um, people with university degrees. Um, so there was a question about training for ecologists, so I thought I'd follow on from that. And uh, most ecologists and environmental managers are trained to at least bachelor's degree level. That is hopefully changing because it has um, contributed to the, the shortages in the sector. And we follow a code of professional conduct as well. Um, so every SIEM member's got to sign up to that. And that's really around how they conduct themselves and how they take responsibility for their, their learning and training and their own competency. So we've got a competency framework. And that sets out several levels um, from, uh, you know, right up uh, from sort of basic level, right up to authoritative level. So we're going from people who can do very straightforward surveys with some supervision, right through to people who are writing guidance on how, on how to do surveys and developing new methods. Um, so we have a whole framework for that. And, and all of our members um, work towards the different levels of membership. Um, that ranges from student members right through to fellows, uh, which is our highest level of membership. And we also offer two different um, professional charterships as well, which full members and fellows are eligible to apply for. Um, so there's, there's quite a rigorous um, framework. Um, one of the key pieces of guidance that we work to that's relevant to development is our ecological impact assessment guidelines. I've got some hyperlinks in the presentation. 
I'm going to be sending Claire lots and lots more after this because that's not the only piece of guidance out there. There's an absolute ton as well on different survey techniques as well. Um, there's also lots and lots of useful guidance um, from Nature Scott on planning and development, and it covers um, a lot of general advice about what sorts of surveys should be commissioned, um, what sorts of areas they should cover um, for, for planners and developers, but there's also quite a lot of in-depth advice for professionals, and there's advice for the general public as well there. So I would say probably the ECIA guidelines and the Nature Scott planning and development advice would be two really good starting points um, if you're not already familiar with those. Um, I thought I'd put up the, the current uh, cover of our, our ecological impact assessment guidelines here. This gets updated um, as legislation changes, as things like um, survey approaches change as well. So for example, last year, the Bat Conservation Trust updated their professional guidance for bat surveys. Um, and this, this includes updates around that. There's ever-changing legislation as well, especially post-Brexit because each part of the UK is doing slightly different things now um, as regards um, some of the legislation that derived from the European Union. Um, so to come on to biodiversity and planning, uh, we've touched very briefly at the start about MPF4 and biodiversity policy. Many planning applications, if they're a major development, so if they're, if they're of a, a big enough scale or if they're nationally important, they're always going to need an EIA. And some local developments will need that as well. So if they're above a certain size, half a hectare, and if they're near uh, an environmentally sensitive site, that's going to trigger EIA. Some types of projects as well. So for example, a nuclear development always needs an EIA. For others, um, there's a process called screening to decide that. Um, the EIA regulations um, themselves, I think, say that that's got to be carried out by competent and qualified people. So um, I did have to help redo part of an EIA about, well, this is going back the best part of 20 years ago, but it, it was unfortunately um, a developer had tried to do it himself and um, it got thrown out by the, the relevant planning authority. And, um, and he then um, realized his error and, and engaged um, some environmental professionals to actually carry out an EIA. Um, so it's got to be carried out by competent people. Biodiversity is one of the mandatory topics in an EIA, and that's usually done through the process of ecological impact assessment or ECIA, and we've got guidelines on that process as well. It's, it's a rigorous, it's a transparent approach. There is a process of gathering information on what you should assess and how it should be assessed and assigning a levels of importance to the different ecological features. Um, that come within the scope of your ECIA. It can be standalone. Um, very rarely for very small uh, local developments that don't need EIA, but generally um, the ECIAs that I've worked on have been part of bigger EIAs. Um, we determine the scope of surveys through desk study consultation and decide on assessment methods as well. Uh, there's standard guidance for that. Again, I've got a link there um, on SIEM's competencies for species survey. And that's that's basically a starting point um, resource there, which can send you to all sorts of guidance um, uh, related to uh, bats, birds, badgers, water voles, um, great crested newts, pine marten, red squirrel. There's lots in there. Um, and that's really a, a sort of reference source as well. It's a little bit out of date, but you know you can certainly follow some of the links in there and find out a little bit more about just some of the standards for different types of surveys as well. And that's constantly being updated, especially for more complex groups of surveys such as bats. I know some of you have been asking about what the law says as well. So we talked a little bit about MPF4 requiring that development enhances biodiversity under policy three. But before it can do that, you still got to protect biodiversity. And any ECIA is going to set out the context of um, how a development um, is going to meet obligations under these key protections. I've not put everything on here because I could give you a list as long as your arm. 
for that. But the key pieces are the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So that covers things like designation of sites of special scientific interest, uh, many of the protections for wild birds, um, and certain other protected species as well. It also covers, um, and that's amended and supported by things like the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act, covers things like how we deal with invasive species, which, you know, it, spread of invasive species is one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss as well. We still have um, different versions of the habitats regulations, even though we're no longer part of the EU. And that deals with European protected species. So bats, otters, great crested newts, um, beavers now as well. And also with um, some of the European level important sites. So special protection areas and um, special areas of conservation. Um, we also consider Ramsar sites in that. Um, there's actually a consultation on the level of protection that Ramsar sites have ongoing at the moment that the Scottish government has released. So um, you might want to um, take a look at that. I'll find the link and send that on as well. Um, biodiversity net gain, um, which is the metric habitat based tool um, that is now mandated in England. That's a feature of planning policy there now. Um, we're a little bit more loosely worded in Scotland. Um, a key outcome under the 2019 Planning Act that's now sitting under policy three of NPF4 is positive benefits for biodiversity. The Scottish government has been for for understandable reasons, quite purposely not overly prescriptive around what they mean by that. The positive benefits have got to be demonstrable. They haven't said you must have a metric in order to demonstrate that. Um, a habitat-based metric is only going to give you part of the picture. That said, they have commissioned Nature Scott to develop a Scottish biodiversity metric, and that's that's very much a work in progress yet at the moment. There's also like certainly the Badgers Act, parts of the Habitats Regulations and the Wildlife and Countryside Act. If you're going to do anything that is going to destroy a resting place of a protected species or um, injure or, or kill that protected species, um, then, you know, you have to avoid doing that. Um, you can get licenses. So if a development requires, unfortunately, the removal of a bat roost or the closure of a badger set, you can do that, but you've got to provide evidence that you've duly surveyed it and also that you've got a plan in place to mitigate that. What are you going to do if you get rid of a bat roost once you've got your planning permission? You can't just do it because you've got planning permission. You have to separately get that licensed and provide some alternative for the bats. Um, I've put don't in capitals here because there was um, a now infamous case that got splashed all over the national press a couple of years ago. Um, Bellway homes were fined £600,000 plus a hefty donation to the Bat Conservation Trust, if I remember rightly. Um, basically, they've been told they'd need a licence to demolish a building. They went ahead and demolished it anyway. And, you know, someone alerted the local council there and, um, you know, they were duly fined. Um, that is the biggest fine, I think, in, in the UK's legal history. Um, so I think a bit of an example was made there. But, you know, it had been told that it wasn't as if they did it just by mistake. They'd been advised by the council and by their consultant ecologist that they would need a license to demolish that building and went ahead anyway. Um, so, you know, there are penalties for that and developers can be held to account there. And I, I think probably the embarrassment of being spread all over the front of the Guardian there I think that's from, um, that will have been a factor as well. Um, so in terms of what ecologists do, um, basically there's sets of legal constraints around developments. So we advise on those um, constraints on the risks to biodiversity from the development and some of the opportunities as well. So where are the opportunities for enhancement? Where are the opportunities to avoid issues as well? So we might advise um, not just on mitigating um, for, say, um, loss of habitat. We might advise on, well, you could create some more as well. So we can get involved on things like location. Do you have to build it right there in the middle of the woodland? Could you move it slightly? Um, some of the design features as well and early planning. Um, for certain types of infrastructure, so roads, railways, overhead lines, those sorts of big linear pieces, there are actually staged processes of deciding exactly where those are going to go. 
and ecologists can get involved in those early stages as well. Um, and a lot of that, you know, is around collecting the data. That's really key. So ecologists can do surveys. We might go out for a season or two. Um, if there are other constraints such as time, you know, we've we've got a, a net zero target to meet for a renewable energy project, or we might have a deadline related to safety under something like the Reservoirs Act, meaning that, um, you know, we have to build a new spillway, which involves clearing some woodland next to a reservoir, and there's a time limit set on that. Um, then, you know, we're not necessarily going to have the luxury of going out there for seven or eight years or more. So that's where local communities can really help by providing that local knowledge and data. We do carry out desk studies. We'll search NBN Atlas. We'll be consulting with um, species recording groups and ENGOs and, and using all of those sources of information, research reports as well. But quite often we find in public consultations on EIA is that there's someone from the community who knows a lot more about the local area than is presented in that. And that's where you can come in and help and just provide that additional context that we won't get from just doing some surveys, because that's always going to be a snapshot in time. Um, so we provide support on all of these things, uh, providing surveys to inform licensing and supporting with the application process. And we also supervise construction processes as well, because things can and do uh, go awry uh, in the day-to-day -day practicalities of being on a construction site as well, and just engaging the builders as well. Um, and we also do work on enhancements or biodiversity net gain, um, and it's measurable or in, in Scottish planning parlance, demonstrable. Um, if we're deciding if we need an ECIA, one thing to be aware of is that the first step will often be a preliminary ecological appraisal. That's usually a walkover of some sort, um, be a phase one or more often these days, a UK HAB survey. So UK Habitat is a newer method of assessing habitats, but also assessing the potential to support protected species on a site or within um, the land around that site as well. Um, and that can vary depending on which species we might be interested in as well. Um, we almost always need an ECIA, even if you don't necessarily need an EIA. So um, PEA is always a starting point for that. What you should expect in an ECIA, there's a handy checklist here, and this might go wrong when I click on this link, but let's give it a go. Um, uh, so SAIM and the Association of Local Government Ecologists have uh, produced a really useful checklist um, and it's it's a bit generic, um, and it could probably do with um, there's an update to some of the references at the bottom, but it does take you through what um, what a planning application should um, should cover really should expect to see uh, for ecology. Um, so it was developed by Saeem and by by uh, council ecologists as well some years ago, and it's really useful. And it also refers to the British standard for biodiversity which sets out some of the requirements um, for ecologists in development. I'm going to attempt to go back to my slides now. But that's a really good checklist that, that you might want to have a look at there. So if you are asked to um, comment on a planning application or want to get involved, that's a, a good um, helping point. Um, there's always a level of screening if it's also an EIA, um, but when we scope an ECIA, we're deciding what we're going to survey and assess and how agree survey methods, especially if they need to be a bit bespoke. If we've got a project where it's not practical to climb every tree for um, 100 miles to um, get an idea of what the bat roosts are, you might want to take a more landscape level approach there. Um, what the time scales and the spatial extents to cover are. So something called the zone of influence, that's going to vary. If you're dealing with um, you know, something like great crested newts, could be up to 500 meters. If you are dealing with um, certain species of birds, so ospreys, we might be looking at 20 kilometers. So it's being mindful of how protected species move as well and how far they get from core areas. The development itself, we need to look at that, not just what they're building, but when and how, and sometimes are they gonna decommission it as well? So there's quite a lot that needs to go into an ecological impact assessment when you're deciding what to include. Um, being aware of other developments nearby and the, the, the cumulative or additional effects and being proportionate as well. So 
Um, for example, I had a project a few years ago where we had a 10 kilometer search radius, um, including all of the designated sites around the development. Um, but actually there was a road um, just to the south of that development, which was gonna be a, an existing barrier to quite a few species. So we agreed with the relevant planning authority and, and with Natural England, which was the body we were dealing with at the time, the you know if we're going to assess um great crested newts here we've already got a major barrier there so looking to the south of the road isn't necessarily going to be um, proportionate to our development this is also a key area where you could get involved with um you know advising on um what's there locally and to study and certainly if it's part of a formal eia a scoping report would be um, consulted on and you'd certainly need to be involved there. You're gathering all that baseline information really to help us decide what ecological features are there, what's important. So the guidelines take you through um, geographic levels of importance from, from local up to international. How is it gonna be affected by the development and is that actually significant? Um, can we, Having decided that, can we avoid the issues? Um, that's part of the mitigation hierarchy and it's something we'd always seek to do in the first instance. So is it timing of works? Can we avoid breeding bird season, for example? Um, location as well, you know, can, can we move the development a little bit to avoid um, a particular river crossing? Um, but can that all change? Um, we can look at, for example, um, just the scale of effects as well. So that's really important to understand. So for example, um, back in the day when I was allowed out on site, I um, used to um, do quite a lot of great crested newt surveys. And one of the key factors there is not just are they there, but what's the population size as well. And that helps in inform how much mitigation you would need to carry out. Um, if you've mitigated and there's still any effects left over, it's deciding if they're still significant as well. And what, what then needs to happen at that point is additional monitoring, what extra compliance needs to be carried out. Compensation, if you can't mitigate. So if you really can't avoid cutting down some trees, are you going to replace them? Enhancement comes over and above that. Um, so that's where we get into positive effects for biodiversity. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion um, at PARD and advised by planners and, and ecologists about the practicalities of trying to do everything on site when you're enhancing. And that would be ideal, but quite often you might not have space to do anything meaningful. So trying to cram as many different plant species into a development's landscape design as possible isn't necessarily the best outcome for biodiversity. You might be better to try and do some planting off site and again, that's where communities can get involved because you'll know the areas. You might even have uh, you know, a woodland creation scheme that you need support for. And some of the larger developers can support on that as well. And they do actively seek that out um, because it helps them demonstrate enhancement as well. But you do want to keep it as local as possible. I did have one planner tell me a while ago um, that you know they'd seen a development presented to them where you know the site was in the north of Scotland and someone had presented enhancements that were going to be located in the central belt, which is not, not at all ideal. So it's really about keeping it as local as possible. And again, it's where communities can help really with that by providing that local knowledge of the area, what's actually going to be sensible as an enhancement. It's a bit of a whistle stop, of course. So a few challenges and constraints, time. So I talked about, you know, the, the amount of time we might have to do surveys. We might be under time limits there. Sometimes funding as well. Um, I've worked on projects where getting it built um, was a factor in um, actually getting funding for it and they'd been given a deadline. Um, the seasons, of course, we all know that's a constraint. Um, and often access to land as well, that can be a limitation. Um, not all developers have statutory powers of entry and even those that do, well, they, they do prefer to ask really. And there's other legislation as well. I mentioned briefly the Reservoirs Act. Um, this, this is an older photo taken on a very old camera, hence it's blurry, but it's a, it's a, a mature old oak uh, in winter. 
and had the conundrum on this uh, project of um, needing to get um, a new spillway built to modern safety standards um, under the reservoirs I built on this project, um, which meant basically digging a huge hole in the side of the hill that these trees were on. Um, we knew that there were going to be issues with breeding birds, so we generally advise we'll try and clear before um, the end of winter. But of course, this looks like a fantastic bat roost tree. So we had a program there of basically leaving as many of the trees as we could and section felling them under supervision uh, by a licensed bat worker who was ready to rescue any bats um, that might be there, but also monitoring any trees that were left as well for breeding birds and having to do that in a phased way rather than being able to clear all the trees at once. Um, the other thing is, Badgers don't read. Um, you can build them a beautiful new set that isn't in a terrible old coal mine that needs to be closed off with a mine water treatment system so that it doesn't leak into a drinking water reservoir. Um, but, you know, they won't necessarily like their nice new set, however beautiful you've made it. And they'll keep trying to go back into the old coal mine sometimes, which is um, this is something that caused me to tear my hair out um, a while ago. So um, or as one client said to me a while, uh, not too long ago, he said, well, it's up to the badgers now, isn't it? So there's always that literal wild card as well to, that we're working with. Oh, I'm sorry, I've clicked off my slides there. Um, I'll just go back to the slideshow. But that's a bit of a whistle stop, I appreciate. So um, if anyone's got any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, we've uh, we've got one minute before um, we go for a break, so I'm going to slip a quick question in. I know we said we wouldn't go to do them until the end, um, but there's a little bit of chat going on around, um, you know, the the reports and ecologists uh, co consulting communities on those reports, and it seems like something that you know, Saeem and Planning Democracy and APRS could sort of talk about more, uh, you mm -hmm. know, of how how you do that within the time constraints and your own constraints. Have you got anything else you would like to say about that? I think a lot of the time is, um, you know, you look at the reason for a development and, and quite often um, I work largely on, on infrastructure development. So quite often there will be an identified need for it. So, you know, switching to renewable energy and the need for net zero um, there might be like, like some of the old reservoirs um, projects that I used to work on. Um, they, um, you know, they, uh, you know, have got um, certain safety considerations because we've got lots and lots of old infrastructure that, you know, we wouldn't build it that way these days, um, particularly old Victorian era um, reservoirs. Um, so it's balancing that against um, biodiversity. And as ecologists, we always want the best outcome for biodiversity. And it's our job to provide the advice and the information to developers they don't always like the answer they get. That's part of our job as well, is to tell them the right answer, not necessarily the one they want to hear. Um, most of them are um, on board with that these days, most of the ones that I worked, worked with more recently, but there's always a few who aren't. Um, so it's really about providing that impartial uh, scientific advice to them and getting as much data as we can. So that's where getting species records and local community information as well is so important. Yeah, I think that leads us very nicely into what um, Christine will be speaking about after the after the break and, and the proaction that mm. people can take to um, collect that data so it is there and to start working with people uh, at, a, at an earlier stage so um great well we'll come back to those some of those questions after the break but for now we'll have a quick five, uh, four minute break uh we'll reconvene um in four minutes uh but if you want to just whiz to the uh, toilet and then um we shall come back uh ready for christine um i hope everybody's uh got time uh, to, to have a comfort break um, and that you're all returning to your seats. Um, Christine um, Tanzi uh, is going to be up now to speak. And as I uh, said, Christine is from the um, National Biodiversity, uh, Better Biodiversity Project at the National Biodiversity Network. So um, if you're 
uh, ready to go, Christine. Um, we shall have you um, start um, just when you're ready. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Claire. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you for the interesting um, start to the webinar series, uh, Caroline. That was uh, really helpful because I think I'm taking a slight sidestep um, with my um, talk, but building on some of the things that were mentioned about how communities and others can contribute to the evidence that often makes up part of the response to the planning system and planning processes. So I um, work for the uh, National Biodiversity Network Trust, um, but specifically on a Scottish project called Better Biodiversity Data. Um, and today, um, I am going to be talking more about the tools and the infrastructure that enable biodiversity data to be collected, shared and used. So that data is there and able to be a part of the evidence needed to support um, the case being made in response to different planning applications or parts of the planning process. So I'm going to cover three sort of areas. One, talking about the NBN Atlas Scotland, and the NBN Atlas has already got a, um, a mention. Um, secondly, talking a little bit about how recording and sharing via some of the recording um, platforms uh, can be done. So particularly focused on iNaturalist UK, but also mentioning iRecord. Um, and then I'm just going to cover a little bit about what is happening in Scotland with um, the project I work on, the Better Biodiversity Data Project, and also um, how that fits in with some major recommendations for improving biological recording and biodiversity data infrastructure in Scotland. So, um, as I mentioned, um, the National Biodiversity Network Trust, our strategy is all about making data work for nature. So we are a small charity and we are very much focused on data and the tools and ways that can be used to support uh, nature in the UK. So we are a UK wide charity. We have four major ambitions. One, that the NBN Atlas is the go-to place for sharing, finding and accessing UK biodiversity data. Secondly, that, that that data is providing evidence needed for nature's recovery. Thirdly, that citizen science is valued, supported and expanded as a major source of biodiversity data. And finally, that the National Biodiversity Network is well connected and, and a collaborative community. So what do we do? Um, we do several things. Um, firstly, we facilitate the National Biodiversity Network. So that is the UK's largest partnership for nature that is made up of several hundred organisations who are members of the National Biodiversity Network um, and cut across uh, from sort of agencies through to uh, small, um, small nature reserves or small recording groups to large uh, ENGOs and others. Secondly, we manage the NBN Atlas, which is the UK's uh, largest uh, national um, and national biodiversity data portal um, to uh, data across the UK. And we lead iNaturalist UK, which is a community of over 130,000 citizen scientists um, that use their phones and also the uh, website to observe wildlife and record their sightings. So as an organization, we are very focused around data um, connectivity and how that data is having an impact for nature. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the National Biodiversity Network um, includes a, a, a wide range of different organizations, and these are just some of them, you know, ranging from museums to nat Natural England to charities uh, like Frog Life um, um, and academic institutions as well. So I've mentioned the NBN Atlas, um, but I wanted to highlight that the NBN Atlas Scotland is the Scotland portal for this, this, this source of information. And within the NBN Atlas Scotland, um, it holds over 36 million occurrence records of species um, that covers over 28,000 species. So that 
those data come from a wide range of data partners who contribute um, uh, to the NBN Atlas Scotland. Um, and there's a, a, a range of data sets that cover different time periods as well. So um, I've put up on the, the screen um, a slide that shows how data flows, biodiversity data flows um, in the UK um, around the NBN Atlas. So as you can see, it is quite complicated. There are multiple sources. There are multiple ways data can be shared with uh, the NBN Atlas as the portal to uh, data that is available. Um, and there are also um, data partners who do not share um, through the NBN Atlas. So it's a very complicated um, network in across the UK and in Scotland. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is a couple of, of key things. So there are um, government agencies, um, ENGOs and local environmental record centers are one of the contributors to the NBN Atlas and who also use NBN Atlas data. Um, there are recording schemes and societies. So they might be running specialist surveys for different types of um, uh, species groups, uh, different taxonomic groups. Um, there are museums and botanic gardens who share some of their records as well. And importantly, on the bottom left, you'll see that the um, iNaturalist UK and iRecord are two platforms used for wildlife observations that people um, that have an established kind of data pathway to the NBN Atlas. I also wanted to flag on the right hand side that there is marine data is also included, some marine data, but there are um, also some established um, databases and other ways in which marine data is shared in the UK, but we do have a relationship with, um, with some of the key ones. So Marine Biological Association uh, that runs DASH and all of this is shared ultimately with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So that is the global um, source for biodiversity data. So once, once it's there, once it's on the NBN Atlas, um, there are a wide variety of users. At the moment, there's over 600 million records are downloaded annually. And from these, this slide, you can see that the, the majority use um, of these downloads is for academic use. There are a reasonably high number of consultants that are also using the NBN Atlas as a portal for supporting desk studies, for example. But there are a number of other ways in which it is used by different uh, different types of users. So non-governmental organizations, um, statutory bodies, or uh, individual landowners, for example, might be interested in finding out if there are records on their own land. But once once that data has been downloaded, there are a number of really important things to think about um, in terms of how it's used. And this strongly relates to um, the way it can contribute to the work that ecologists do when they're doing desk studies, but also how um, how different people that are part of this uh, webinar may be able to access um, and use the data on the NBN Atlas. So cr most crucially is that there each um, record is available under a specific um, record license. Three of those are open, um, Creative Commons licenses CC0 and CC BY and the open government license. But there is one license um, that is a shared license, which is CC BY NC, and that means that they are not um, available for commercial purposes without prior agreement of the data provider. So when you are either a user of the NBN Atlas data, knowing um, knowing what license the records you have downloaded um, has is really important. But also if you are a data partner and you wish to provide your um, data to the NBN Atlas, in order for it to have the widest impact, you would want to be sharing it under an open license rather than the more limited um, license that um, does not allow commercial use. There are some other things to think about um, 
whether what the spatial resolution of records are, um, if they have been verified, um, whether there are dates associated with the record and what those dates are, and whether it's actually a negative record because there are some records of absence, um, as well as making sure you are citing the NBN Atlas data correctly and there are guidelines for how to do that available from the NBN Atlas um, website. So there are, there are a number of ways in which the NBN Atlas might be useful to communities or those interested in looking at their own local area. You can, you can search by location um, and see what records are available for a, a particular area. Um, those records are then displayed. You can view them and uh, investigate them more, um, as well as downloading the records. And you can also make choices when you download the records so that they exclude unconfirmed identifications or they exclude those that are covered by the, um, the, license, the CCBYNC license. So before I move on to just uh, briefly covering a bit about recording and sharing, um, um records i just wanted to to highlight again that a huge huge portion of the data that is available on the nbn atlas is collected through volunteer effort and that is often through um enthusiastic and expert recorders um that have been um involved in biological recording for some time but that also means that um there are data gaps. So there are um, a lot of recording happens on a basis where people do what they can. But that means that if you are searching for your own area and you think, oh, there's there's not much here, it might be that it is just a, um, you know, it has fallen through other, other people's attention. So there's a really, really um, key role that um, com communities that are interested in, a, interested in a particular place can play in contributing to um, the biodiversity data that kind of showcases what, what an area holds. So I'm just gonna move on a little bit to talk about the um, ways in which recording and sharing um, biodiversity data can be done using some of the current uh, recording platforms. So uh, many of you will be aware there are lots of different platforms and apps out there that will tell you they'll do different things and offer you different ways to record um, uh, wildlife. Um, but I'm gonna focus on two that are two of the, the key tools that record all species groups and that have an established data flow to the NBN Atlas. So these both have um, a, um, a route that means ultimately data that has been um, records that have been submitted and verified and have reached a, you know, a, a quality good enough to verify should be ending up at, on the publicly accessible portal that is the NBN Atlas. And those two are iNaturalist UK and iRecord. There are a number of um, more species uh, group specific recording apps that also share data. Uh, the example I'll just flag is BirdTrack that is um, that is run by the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, but I'm going to focus on these two as ones that are more general looking at multiple species groups. So they are free to use. They allow recorders to submit and manage observations. And those records are verified by a network of volunteer geographic and taxonomic experts. So experts in specific um, species groups, they might have um, be part of established uh, recording societies or um, um, who, who have uh, hold a lot of the expert knowledge um, on different species in the UK. So uh, my main focus is going to be iNaturalist UK, um, as I believe iRecord is going to be um, hopefully looked at in a little bit more depth in a later webinar. Um, and uh, iNaturalist UK is currently led by the NBN Trust, by one of my colleagues. It is um, used through both a website and an app, and it is like several different recording um, platforms, is a community where members of the uh, platform in, uh, engage with each other to look at the records that have been submitted and to help with the verification process and interact. 
It is also, member of a, also a member of a large network of iNaturalists around the world. So there are 21 different iNaturalists based in different parts of the world. There are a lot of different groups who use iNaturalist UK and one of the ways in which it is potentially a helpful platform for community-based um, community initiatives is that you can set up a project. So on iNaturalist UK, you can set up a specific project. You might have a particular interest in a area, um, in a local, uh, you know, a local area, or you might have a particular interest in a group such as on the bottom right here, Diptris Forum. They are the um, specialist recording society um, focused on flies. Um, so there are lots of different um, different groups that make use of this this particular feature of iNaturalist UK, and I'm just going to highlight a couple that might be useful examples to people on this webinar. So, um, based in Glasgow, York Hill Green Spaces um, Biodiversity is a um, a group, a community led group who manage several parks and green spaces. Um, in the West End of Glasgow, they started to increase the amount of recording they did on those sites to help inform their knowledge of the biodiversity to see if what they were doing was effective for biodiversity and it has affected their management choices that they've made um, in the York Hill Green Spaces area. So um, the examples I'm giving might not necessarily relate to planning um, issues, but I wanted to highlight them because they are very much being driven by, by groups who are looking to um, have a specific outcome or an impact in, in, in an area. So when you set up your project page, it'll give you these basic inf this information about how many observations have been made about an area or as part of your project. Um, I just wanted to highlight that it'll tell you where you ha um, have observations that still need an identification. So that's the yellow part of that ring um, you can see on the screen. And you'll also get your map of your local area with each of those observations plotted so that you can go in and explore the records themselves. Another example this time um, from England is a, um, a group based in Nottingham City who are have been working to um, change the practices of their local authority, the city, the local council, in management of uh, uh, the, the pavements and to reduce the amount of spraying to enable biodiversity to better thrive in the urban area. So they have um, also gone down the route of using um, iNaturalist UK to demonstrate how much is being recorded in that area and provide that kind of evidence for what they are doing in terms of advocating for change uh, locally. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight a, a nice example, which is slightly different. It's more about rainforest restoration in Argyll. Um, and it is um, involves a number of different groups. So you can see that there are small groups, each looking at different parts of this area and you can see what records have been submitted by these different groups. So it enables you to get a bigger picture of what is going on in that area. So when you are, um, if you're interested in using iNaturalist UK, um, it is pretty simple to set up. Um, there are a couple of tips to make sure you do to, to affiliate to iNaturalist United Kingdom. Um, so you need to do that if you set up an account and go to your account to make sure that you select the CC0 license for observations. So that enables those observations to be shared um, in an open way and made useful for anybody wanting to access that information in future. And it is available for use by anybody to ensure it has the impact that you want it to. Some kind of good practice is that you might get more interaction with the community if you're using your real name. If you have other recording uh, platforms that you use, it can be helpful to use the same name across those. Um, and um, once you've done that, just to get out there and actually go recording. One thing I would um, also just note is you can download um, 
observations from iNaturalist as well. So if you're looking to gather a particular piece of uh, body of information from a certain certain area, you can do that. You can uh, uh, query the data and download that that you need. So just before I move on to a brief um, rundown of the Better Biodiversity Data Project, I want to mention iRecord, which is a really critical part of the um, data flow um, in the UK and how it leads to the NBN Atlas. It is a website and app also for sharing and managing wildlife observations that's operated by the Biological Record Centre, which is based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. It is very widely used by national recording schemes. So those are the specialist, um, more specialist recording schemes that focus on specific um, species groups, different different taxonomic groups. Um, and uh, it's particularly, particularly well used by experienced recorders and verifiers. So when iNaturalist um, data is shared, it is first shared to iRecord so that it can be verified before going ultimately to the NBN Atlas. So it, it has a really critical role to play um, in um, ensuring data is high quality and made available um, for wider use. And just, yeah, just to note that if you are starting to use recording tools as a community group, or if you are wanting to explore this way of gathering evidence that might feed into what you're doing, use the one that suits you best. And if you are involved in an event, for example, there is something called City Nature Challenge, which takes place across the world and across UK, the UK cities, and that's run through iNaturalist UK. If you are very keen on looking at specific recordings, um, uh, recording um, schemes or societies, you might wish to be to investigate iRecord. If you are using these kind of tools, um, it's best to record in one place only um, to keep things simple. And just to note that they have different strengths and limit limitations. Um, and they are not the only tools that share with um, NBN Atlas. So I mentioned bird track before and mammal tracker is another um, is another tool that also shares data with the NBN Atlas. Um, but these are two ones that are really helpful to know about. So just in the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project that I currently work on. So in Scotland, um, the NBN Trust is currently um, hosting the Better Biodiversity Data Project. We are a two year funded project uh, funded by NatureScot and um, by the Scottish Government. And the aim is really to support the ambitions of the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy by helping secure access to data needed. And that's partly to do with setting targets, measuring progress, feeding into the other, um, other areas that the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy covers. We um, also work with the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum Advisory Group um, and the overall aim is to help develop a fit for purpose infrastructure in Scotland that will help with biodiversity data services. So that's providing data and interpretation of the data um, for wider use. The whole project came out of a big review that was published in 2018 by SBIF, the Scottish Biodiversity Information Forum, which looked at how you would transform the infrastructure in Scotland to improve access and use of biodiversity data. So that covered um, um, recommendations around data flows to increase um, the ease of the links with the NBN Atlas Scotland, um, included transforming service provision to ensure that there was better coverage across Scotland, um, um, improving funding so that there's a long term and more secure funding for coordinating body and key organisations um, and in improving the structure and culture in Scotland. Um, and, there's, and finally, to help enabling that transition to happen by 2030. So this is... Um, an ongoing part of the Scottish biodiversity strategy. So last year, actually nearly a year ago, the consultation of the five year delivery, first five year delivery framework for the Scottish uh, biodiversity strategy was closed in December last year. Um, and 
the Better Biodiversity Data Project, as you can see highlighted on this slide, was named as something that is important to help build on the steps uh, to a more strategic approach to collecting, collating, sharing data um, across Scotland and just making sure citizen science is um, continue to be supported as, as an important um, component of providing evidence. So we have three, um, three objectives. One is about providing a, nation, uh, a nationwide partnership, providing biodiversity data services on behalf of Scotland. The second is about providing a, a fit for purpose data management and digital services system, which helps provide uh, financially sustainable services to users. And the third is more about the overall community. So making sure it's connected and functional and follows fair and open data principles across different sectors in Scotland. So a really um, important group of uh, core partners for the BBD project, I've mentioned a, a couple of times, and I think it came up earlier, are local environmental record centers and also um, recording groups. Um, so there are a number of these that cover the majority, but not the entirety of Scotland. Um, and they uh, work on local and regional um, scales to provide uh, biodiversity data services to local authorities and to other clients, um, and may also be a route through which uh, local communities can engage in um, looking at what is going on uh, at a more local level. So we are also working um, with a, a much wider range of partners in Scotland um, to talk about uh, ultimately improving access and um, service provision uh, for biodiversity data as well. So I've just got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna tell you where we've got to. Our first objective is to help um, create by uh, help make Scotland wide biodiversity services um, uh, a reality. So we are working hard to create a new consortium of members, and that will include our local environmental record centres and um, re recording groups. Ultimately, um, in Scotland, that work together to have a joined voice though each retaining an individual presence in their own local uh, region. We're working with a um, <clears throat> Scottish Enterprise, uh, legal advisors, the Association of Local Environmental Record Centres and a number of others to help establish this legal um, kind of consortium to, to, for this to actually happen. Uh, and that should be in place by March 2025 when we are uh, finishing our um, initial two year period. A part of what we're doing involves testing out some different types of service we can provide. So that might be um, dashboards that enable you to see NBN Atlas data, for example, visualized um, in a way that is useful for, um, for potential data service clients, particularly those that operate at a Scotland wide level that may include infrastructure companies, um, so transport or uh, energy energy based companies as well are, are some of some of the people that might um, also use these to then signpost them to other sources of data that will include local environmental record centers, for example. Secondly, we are working at the moment with a developer to produce um, a new uh, database system that is runs on the cloud to provide um, a more um, secure um, future for biodiversity data that is held by our local um, networks. I'm aware I'm just about out of time, but I probably can finish up in about a minute, if that's okay, Claire. Great, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that is, I just was gonna say, that's involved a lot of consultation with a lot of our core partners and essentially, what we want this new system to do is to link very closely with the NBN Atlas um, and ensure that data is flowing uh, both ways and supporting lots of service provision um, around Scotland. And finally, about the overall community um, kind of focus of biodiversity data um, is less of a tangible outcome. 
what we have done is started to look more closely at the data flows, seeing where there are more bottlenecks and understand barriers across sectors. So that might be academics not sharing data or the challenges some consultants face in sharing data after they have then gone out and done surveys, which we know is in the best practice guidance from SAIM, but is in reality something that is actually uh, done by a quite a limited number of consultants. So making sure that data um, ends up somewhere is is would be great <laughs> so we've we've produced a short update to the recommendations that were that were um published in 2018 um that just shows a progress update really of where have we got to um with the 24 recommendations to transform the infrastructure and how does that align with the scottish biodiversity strategy and what do we need more from different sectors so I will share the actual link with um, the organizers after this, but that QR code on the screen will also take you to that recently published um, uh, update. So last point to make is just that we have been advocating for the, um, the overall community in Scotland uh, with policymakers and decision makers as well. So we've had a three day exhibition at the Scottish Parliament in September of this year. And we focused a lot on biodiversity data stories. So where have communities and other people who are involved in biodiversity data been involved in providing evidence that's had impact? So that included things like contributing evidence for a new um, triple SI. It included um, um, uh, helping uh, identify an area for an urgent marine protected area to be to be designated um, and various other um, other examples. So there are ways in which you can um, uh, can showcase that impact. Um, I apologize that got very rushed at the end, but um, I'm also happy to take questions away with me for my colleagues that work on the MBN Atlas and um, on iNaturalist UK, if there are things that I cannot answer. Thanks very much, uh, Christine. That's that's really great, and thank you, Caroline, too, for um, really excellent overviews on on what's actually really complex topics. Um, and uh, so, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions for Caroline, and we've got a couple for uh, Christine. We'll have time for probably only those, um, and and I'll answer one uh, while I'm while while those two uh, thinking about their answers. Um, but I wondered whether um, Caroline, maybe you could uh, comment. I don't know whether you can about anything that we can do to stop developers destroying habitat prior to planning applications uh, being determined. And this is something that we see quite a lot happening. Um, and if there's any legislation or anything that can be done. Um, and um, there was another question from Brett about the uh, legal status of the mitigation hierarchy. Um, and, uh, you know, if, there, if there's anything that can be uh, strengthened and, 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 and how does uh, the sequential test work with regard to the mitigation hierarchy um and there was also actually one about how do you how do you ensure that the scoping uh is is uh done by a competent professional because that's something that often is left to the planners isn't it um the scoping for the eias um so those are a couple that caroline might be able to answer um how can we speed up records um uh Christine, um, there's uh, some of the fungal uh, records take over five years. And is that something that the uh, your project is trying to do? Laura asked about photoing, uh, photographing animals and things. Just wanted to say we will be having a session from Natalie from TWIC, uh, Natalie Harmsworth and, and, and some community volunteers on uh, recording data and stuff, so we that that's next ne the next session, but we can't cover everything uh, all in, in in the first session. Um, and while you two are thinking about those questions, um, somebody asked about: Do you have to be designated um, as a, 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 a you know an area um, species area to be protected? Otherwise, there's no protection. Um, that's going to come up in a in a future 
webinar um with um we're hoping to get some in our nature networks webinar um and they're sort of discuss discussing these um other um oecms these other effective area-based conservation measures um for non-designated sites so th there's people thinking about that question um right caroline could i okay uh, um i'm just trying to keep track of the questions there i mean on the first one there i i, I would point at some of the legislation that i shared there um you know um there are um mechanisms for reporting um wildlife crime for example um so you can do that i'd say be factual um don't speculate or offer opinions when you're doing that i've been in the unfortunate position of having to do that a couple of times where you know we've been aware of um things like badger sets that were present and then the next day they weren't um not necessarily tied to a development specifically but while we were out doing surveys before any development happened and you know it's just presenting that information and letting the the relevant local wildlife crime liaison officer um deal with that um it is about being factual with that um the um the question about competency and eia scoping um uh, eia scoping reports are generally written by environmental specialists and it'll cover all the relevant topics there so there will have been a level of competent input put in there um in terms of how that's shared if it's a formal eia scoping report because the project needs an eia then that has to be shared publicly by the the relevant planning authority it's got to be put up on planning portal so in terms of who writes it, it's usually um consultants who are engaged to do that and in the particular case of ecology um british standard um 42020 um sets out the requirements for competencies there I can share a link to the British standard. Um, there are references to it elsewhere that are free. For some reason, um, the British Standards Institute likes to charge quite a lot of money for um, letting you um, access its publications. Um, so uh, you might want, want to um, seek it from another source, um, from a reference source. I must confess, I missed the second question in that, Claire, if you wouldn't mind repeating it. Yes, sorry, I did uh, gabble them a bit. Uh, it was about the legal status status of the mitigation hierarchy. Um, you know, it should be there, followed. Um, in terms of the the legal status, um, I mean, really, um, I would turn to the EIA regulations on that one. Um, and look at what is expected to be covered in an EIA. There's a lot of best practice guidance as well, but generally. Uh, you know, you've got to avoid before you start trying to mitigate. Um, there is, um, within the EIA process, there is consideration of alternatives as well that you've got to demonstrate when you submit that. And also in the parallel process of HRA, which applies to SSEs, SPAs, and is also applied to Ramsar sites, um, you have to demonstrate that you really have considered the alternatives. So there are a few mechanisms in there um, there isn't anything written down to my knowledge that says you must follow this hierarchy legally, but it would be pretty difficult to, um, you know, present an application having not followed that hierarchy and demonstrated that, um, you know, it's, it's, they have to show that they've done everything they can to avoid harm or to try and reduce it. And if they can't do that, they've got to compensate or offset. Hopefully that Thanks, answers Caroline. the no, question. I, sorry, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't turn, turn my uh, audio on for a minute. Um, sure, no problem. Yeah, thanks. And and then if there's anybody else in the um in the chat that wants to add to some of these uh, answers as well, it, it's useful, some of the things that people have also been uh, talking about in the chat. So do carry on your conversations there. Um, yes, Christine, I was asking you about how we speed up, up the records. Um, yeah. Could you, uh... I, I, it, it is an ongoing challenge because uh, particularly when it comes to verification, there are usually a relatively small number of people who have the knowledge to be able to verify records. And that means that they uh, give an awful lot of time to look at a lot of records based from a lot of different places. I would highlight a couple of things is that using 
your connections with your local environmental record center or recording group may be a way of getting um, some additional um, local context and expertise if you are struggling to hear back through some of the national level uh, like um, routes that you can submit records. Um, it is, I mean, not to be underestimated <laughs> how, how useful that can be. Um, there are a number of groups around the, um, we can share some links. Um, I've just noticed a question about how to find local recording groups. Um, and, I, and actually investigating some of the, if you are get involved in any of the on, online recording um, um, platforms, making yourself known and actually making connections with people may help you with that. But I don't have an answer for the overall question. It is a ongoing issue that goes beyond one specific group um, just through the the kind of the nature of our reliance on people who are experts giving their time to verify records and then making those available. Um, uh, was there another question about photos, uh, Claire, I think? And if the question was about if it's useful to, then if you're using any of the tools and platforms like websites and apps, then photos mean your record is much more likely to go more quickly through the verification process. Bearing in mind, some species cannot be identified by a photo. <laughs> yes, and I think we had some very helpful answers uh, in the chat uh, around that, uh, that you can use scat and fish scales and all sorts of things. So, But we will find out because that leads us nicely into the next session. And I do want to say thank you so much to Caroline and Christine for taking the time, um, your own time, to uh, come and speak to us tonight. Uh, you, you've worked very hard at those um, and it's really, really useful. Um, so next session, we will have Natalie Harmsworth, Harmsworth from the uh, Wildlife Information Centre um, and some uh, community recorders who are actively out there doing this. Um, and so they'll be uh, trying to help you to, to get to grips with all of this. Um, so thanks everybody. Thanks for being so engaged. Uh, great chat going on. Um, we'll um, try and answer some of the questions when we come back to you with the recording and the speakers um, uh, slides and some of the links. So you will be hearing from us. Um, so uh, yeah, but sign up for the next uh, webinar. This is not a one one off thing i think it's a it's a series uh, and it's a, and we're all learning and we need to um take a little bit of time to for it all to go in so by next month we we might be at that stage where we're we'll ready to hear from uh, natalie and our fantastic uh, community recorders so thank you all for coming uh take care and uh, yeah get out there start recording and just before we finish, I want to say a great big thank you to Claire because she's put a huge amount of effort into this. And just to point out that all of those amazing notes that you put into the chat are not going to be lost. We've downloaded those and we're going to be looking at them in our planning of the future webinar. So we've got all winter for this. It's going to get see us through the cold, dark months. So um, we and we all look forward to seeing you in person in March because we will have an in-person one when when the sun comes back over the horizon. We'll we'll be meeting up in person and perhaps download some apps onto our own phones and do a little bit of recording ourselves. So thank you very much, Claire. <laughs>